Hey everyone, Dan here, and welcome again to that paintball channel. In today's episode, we are going to cover paintball physics. Oh yes, the most foundational bedrock element when it comes to paintball accuracy. Without this, everything else is just a footnote. And if we fail to properly understand this, we will never get anywhere near anything like paintball accuracy. We will be spinning our wheels, chasing after fairy tales, throwing good money after bad, and frankly, the sport has had enough of that. So let's just jump in. I'm going to start at the absolute beginning, making no assumptions about anything. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of technical stuff, and I'm going to be trying to uh, put it into very plain language. And by the way, if you've got a background in fluid mechanics or something like that, yes, I am very aware painfully aware of the fact that I am oversimplifying pretty much all of this. But I don't want to get lost out in the weeds and, you know, lose people. You know, and if you understand this stuff, there's no point anyway. I mean, you already understand it. So let's just begin at the very beginning, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a paintball. And paintballs are small and round. And when they fly, they shed vortices. So, that's the basic. And when it comes to accuracy in paintball, everything comes down to and turns on the physical characteristics of the paintball and the way in which it sheds vortices. Now, I was thinking a long time about how to uh, make this make sense. And I think probably the best example of this would be to talk about uh, airplane flight. Uh, because the way in which airfoils work translates to understanding how paintballs operate when they fly. And the forces that work on them both are the same forces. They just work very differently. So an airfoil essentially works in a couple of ways. Uh, it could work by, in terms of the camber that it has, you know, sort of the curvature. It could also work by angle of attack. And, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about how lift operates. But in the most stripped down basic sense, uh, you've got, um, uh, you know, Newton's third law comes into play uh, to a great degree. As air is, is moving along, the airfoil essentially creates uh, a force that forces the air to change direction. And because, of course, air has mass, equal and opposite force, you know, so as the air hits it, it's being directed downward. Same, you know, this works both on top and below the airfoil. And that changing of direction of the air creates a, a counter force in the other direction, and that's what gives lift. Now then, that's an airfoil, and it's working in ways that we can understand and predict, and so the air is being directed in a very controlled manner, relatively speaking, and also in a predictable manner. But now, let's forget for a moment the airfoil and think about what happens when air comes into contact with something like a cylinder. So, whereas before, with the airfoil shape, you know, the air is going to be moving over in a very sort of predictable way, but now you've got this completely round object. And maybe a way to think about it, you know, if you've ever been in a hallway and you, you, you're coming at some person and they're walking toward you and you do that little, uh, which way are you going to go? If you think about it, air kind of sort of does that. Uh, it doesn't have that clear flow path, and air does not move evenly around the cylinder. And so what happens is that you have these sort of alternating uh, flow paths that go around. You know, the air sort of stacks up, and it smoothly rolls around, and then it begins to shear off. And it creates these little vortexes as they come off. Well, because it's not perfectly balanced in the way that this uh, that the air flows over it, these vortices will alternate in the way that it sheds. So, you know, one time more air is going to come, and then it sheds vortexes, uh, vortices rather. Uh, another time it's going to be on the bottom. And so, what happens is that it begins to alternate, and because remember. It's the same principle as, as uh, works when you're engaging in wing lift. So it's not just that the air just kind of rolls off and has no effect. 
No, because of that mass and because of Newton's third law, it is creating force. And on a cylinder, because it alternates, you get these fluctuating uh, patterns of lift. And so if you, uh, you know, if you've ever seen a chimney, like a thin chimney in a high wind or even a pole, uh, or if you take uh, maybe a thin stick and you whip it through that air, that whoop, you know, just that fluttering sound, it's because of this uh, vibration. And so you get what's called uh, vortex-induced vibrations. And, you know, certain kinds of uh, buildings, this can be a serious issue. And architecture involves a lot of care in thinking about how tall buildings can avoid the damage that can cause as a result of this. So that is, uh, that's a cylinder. Now, what happens if we move away from the cylinder and we think about a sphere? Now then, instead of just having air moving sort of over the top and over the bottom, because we're dealing with a sphere, air is now moving around every single point. And what that's doing is, you know, it's alternating all around and it's creating these uh, vortices. And what that's doing is creating lift force, not simply, you know, top and bottom, but rather 360 degrees uh, perpendicular to the d direction of flight. So whereas, uh, you know, a cylinder, it, you know, imagine air is sort of coming at us, the cylinder will do this, blah, 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 blah. Well, now with a sphere, the inclination is for it to do this, just wobble all over the place. <clears throat> and that is essentially what's going on uh, when we're dealing with uh, paintball flight. Now, this raises a number of serious issues. And I think, you know, a lot of people have no idea that this is what's taking place. They, they imagine that when a paintball is shot, you know, and people will talk about, oh, you know, ball on ball accuracy and something shooting lasers and things like that. It's simply not true. You know, paintballs are wandering all over the place. So this leads us to two of the fundamental difficulties and really detriments when it comes to paintball accuracy. And you've got a major problem and you've got a minor problem. And we'll first talk about the minor problem. The minor problem is that paintballs are completely inconsistent. They're inconsistent in terms of their size, they're inconsistent in terms of their shape, and they're inconsistent in terms of their fill. So this inconsistency doesn't simply go, you know, just from a little bit to a little bit. Where It's not just brand to brand. It goes box to box, bag to bag, ball to ball within the bag. No two paintballs are alike. Just think of them like snowflakes. They're completely different. Every single one is completely different. And given the fact that they have different sizes, different shapes, different fills, that means different weights, they're going to behave very different, and that's just relative to one another. Now, we're going to come back to this minor issue, and I call this the minor issue because it's it's bad enough, but that's not the real issue. Uh, the real issue turns on the most fundamental uh, qualities of a paintball. Now, I think a lot of people who are pretty well informed, more informed than uh, your typical player, will understand that paintball accuracy comes down to the paint. And, you know, the paint is the most important issue without question. But I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, well, you know, we know that paintballs are all different sizes, they're all different shapes, they have different densities and things like that. So if we could just get paint that would be perfect perfectly round, perfectly consistent in terms of its size and its fill, then we could get uh, something very much like paintball accuracy. Well, the problem is this has already been done, and it's been done a long time ago and for a long time. Back in the early 90s, AGD, of course, uh, the great innovators, they developed perfect paint. You know, Tom K looked at paint, did tons and tons and tons of studies, took, you know, lots and lots of measurements, gathered lots of data, 
and recognized quickly that one of the big issues has to do with how bad paint is. So they made their own perfect paint. It's called Perfect Circle. It still exists. And it it is absolutely perfectly round. It's perfectly consistent. And it's pretty much out of your and my reach. Uh, it, it goes to state, local officials, you know, federal, police, military, etc., law enforcement, they get that paint. Uh, you and I can't get that paint. It, it's absurdly expensive. I, if, if last time I checked, it was something like $200 a case, and you and I can't get it anyway, so it doesn't matter. But the problem is, that perfect circle paint is still inaccurate. And so now we have to think about, okay, wait a minute. You know, they made perfect paint, it's perfectly round, perfectly consistent, and it's still inaccurate. Well, how is this possible? Well, the way that it's possible is because of the bait is, is the major issue with paint. And the, that is that paint is simply too light for its size. It lacks the density. Because it's so light, if you think about it, remember these, these shedding forces they're always producing an effect. And the problem is that, you know, when you're thinking about overall physics, mass has a kind of inverse relationship to those shedding forces. So a very, very heavy object, you know, for a given velocity will resist those forces simply because it has that mass. Um, but a very, very light object will be all over the place. It would be, you know, heavily influenced by those forces. Now, uh, the current standards that govern paintballs uh, stipulate that uh, the maximum weight for a paintball is uh, 3.5 grams, I believe. And, you know, people will always talk about, oh, you know, if we could just get a little bit more weight in there, or certain balls, you know, a lot of paint weighs less than the 3.5 grams. But I think people think, oh, if you could just put just a little bit more in there, it would really make a big difference. Well, once more AGD tested that. They actually made a double density paintball and they found that it was still not accurate. Indeed, it wasn't until you get up to completely lethal densities that paint will begin to overcome those uh, shedding forces. So what that means is, you know, what it all comes down to is the only way that you can get rid of the inherent difficulties in paintballs are a make them so dense you know to be able to overcome these uh vortex shedding effects that they become lethal or completely change the shape of the paintball uh so that it ceases to be a paintball you know first strike rounds are fine they're they're much much more accurate but the problem is you know, you've, you've got to go mag-fed as far as that goes. And e even back then, you know, Tom K. talked about the fact that, you know, that there had been some thought about making oblong-shaped paint, something that would be very aerodynamic that would fly a lot better. But he said, you know, there's something fun about just dumping in a, a pot of, of paint and shooting it. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're faced with. Um, either we completely get away from what paintballs are all about or else we have to simply recognize that you know paintballs inherently are simply not accurate um, and again this is something that a lot of people don't want to get you know to, to come to grips with or come to terms with but we absolutely have to recognize it um, you know the <laughs> paintballs are inherently inaccurate and you know even the best paint is not going to be terribly accurate so whatever else we're doing you know in the in the subsequent episodes we're going to be talking a little bit more about paint we'll be getting into barrels and equipment and and skill sets but we do need to recognize that you know whatever we're doing it's always going to be an accommodation to the basic limitations of paint, and those limitations are pretty substantial. Now, you know, please don't misunderstand and think, well, you, it means that we can't hit anything or something like that. Well, of course you can, you can hit things with paint, but until we first come to grips with the fact that no paint ever, there's no paint that you and I can ever get 
that is going to be, you know, like laser beams. Uh, it, it's just not going to be that way. So, uh, once we can get our minds around that, then I think we can sort of become happy again. Uh, you, when you, Once you recognize there isn't some kind of magical silver bullet, no pun intended, that's out there waiting. Oh, if we could only just get paint that was just a little bit better, it, you know, it would it would be okay. The, the most perfect paint possible is still inaccurate. It's a lot better than what we have, but it's not that much better than what we have. So, uh, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of this, um, you know, and then once we come back and we talk about, you know, the, the inconsistencies that, that go on in, in what we would normally consider to be very good paint, we see kind of what we're up against. So, for uh, our next episodes, we're going to be looking more closely at, you know, real world paint and barrel uh, issues and how that works to further modify the, the inaccuracies that are already inherent uh, to paintballs. So, stay tuned. Again, uh, bring a friend. Hope this has been helpful and very much looking forward to the next episode.